Morning, welcome to chapel. Dr. Frank Pollard, who is our scheduled uh, preacher for today, can't be with us because of some health situations, so we want to pray for him as uh, we move into this chapel experience. We're grateful that Dr. Jim Shaddix is going to be able to preach God's Word uh, to us today, so be prepared to hear a word from the Lord through this preacher whose heart is given to communicating God's Word and teaching others to communicate God's Word with power and uh, with fire. So I want to pray for Brother Jim as he shares today in preaching. Grateful for Chris and the leadership she's given already in worship and uh, for Dr. Gabriels who's going to come and lead us in praise and for the seminarians who are going to lead us in worship as well before Dr. Shaddix preaches. Hymnal there, it's uh, hymn number 133. The blood will never lose its power. And then we'll sing together a couple stanzas of 132. There's power in the blood. Let's uh, sing this morning remembering the price Christ paid at Calvary. Let's stand together, please. The blood will never lose its power. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain it flows to the lowest valley
wonderful arrangement, that hymn, uh, There is a Fountain. You may be seated. Father, we thank you for that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Thank you that for all of us in this room who know you as personal Lord and Savior, that because of that blood we've been made clean. Because we've been made clean and you claim us as children. And you come into this experience of worship with us. Help us to know you are here. Enable us to be aware of the fact that you are present and that you have been bringing this worship experience about from the foundation of the world. 
Thank you for that fountain of blood that makes it possible for us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray that you will be with Dr. Shaddix as he preaches. Thank you for the unction you're going to give him to preach your word powerfully. And thank you for the unction you're going to give us to listen to his word with obedience. Help us as we hear not to complain about the duties that are holding upon us in this text. Help us to embrace the challenges that you give us from this preaching event. Help us to embrace those challenges with vigor, because after all, Jesus did die for our sins. He paid it all, and all to him we owe in his name. Amen. One thirty four, Jesus paid it all.
seminarians, thank you so much for sharing with us and leading us in worship this morning. How privileged we are. God to have invested so much giftedness, ability in our institution. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to a very familiar passage of Scripture. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I want to tell you from the very outset this morning, I am uh, uh, feel very unworthy to uh, pinch hit for Dr. Pollard. I'm sorry that he's not able to be here. Uh, Dr. Charlie Ray told me a story uh, some time ago when he was a student here, when Dr. Pollard came to campus to preach uh, here in chapel. And Dr. James Taylor, who taught preaching, uh, had a class immediately after the chapel service, and so he had invited Dr. Pollard on the spur of the moment to come and speak to his class. And uh, Dr. Pollard uh, finished the message and went straight to the class, and Dr. Taylor had already started the class and was introducing him as he walked in and gave him this big flowery introduction and uh, then turned to Dr. Pollard and said, Dr. Pollard, and so now we await to hear what you have to say. To which Dr. Pollard responded, and so do I. Uh, That's kind of the way I feel this morning. Uh, We wait to hear what Dr. Pollard has to say, and I'm waiting to see what I've got to say. So uh, you uh, bear with me uh, as we share this time together. I want to talk to you uh, this morning about being anchored to the finish. Being anchored to the finish. Being tied to the completion of the race. I'm not sure how it is with you. I have a tendency to think that there's probably some similarity there. I'm still waiting to see what I'm going to say. (laughs) But I know that I could identify one time in the midst of every semester, same song every semester, and it happened about this particular time, right at the verge of the midterm. Regardless of what program I was in, what classes I I was taking, it seemed at that particular time, everything seemed to pile up to the point that literally, I was thinking, I can't do this. And I want to just just share my heart with you this morning. I, I mean this in all sincerity. I know on a number of occasions, coming to that time in the midst of the semester, Going home, closing the door in my room, sitting there and literally weeping, crying. Saying, Lord, I, I can't do this. It's too much. It's too much. But you know, as I reflect upon that and I think about it in the context of a seminary career and taking classes, even though that is the burden that maybe many of us share because I know these professors still have days like that in which we look around and say, not only are we making any difference, but can we really do this? Can we pull this thing off? There is so much stacked up. Even all of that, whether it's seminary work or seminary teaching or whatever our lot in, it's still a small issue compared to that same reality in kingdom work. You see, this may not be very encouraging for you, but I want you to know that when this is all said and done and we're out there in the real world and we're in the local church or in the counseling center or we're at the homeless shelter or wherever it is we are, there are going to be times when we're looking around and we're looking at the people we're dealing with and we're looking at the stuff that's piling up and we're going to come to those same places where we've got to wonder, am I going to get through this? Can I really make it? You know, it's right in the middle of those times. I know when I find myself longing for some word of encouragement, it always makes me think of those, uh, uh, have you seen those successory things? You ever been to the mall? You know, maybe some of those sports shops or, you know, the paraphernalia and those successory items or those beautiful pictures. They have some theme to them and there's some motivational word that drives you to success something that is supposed to just get you going and the big word will be there and then underneath there will be a little slogan that that is just so inspiring. It just makes you want to go, ah, wow, relief. You seen some of those? Maybe you need some today. I don't know if you don't, you will in ministry. I pulled some off the internet yesterday, off of the Successories website. You may have seen some of them. 
This particular one has pictures of some steps uh, going up into a mountain, some rock steps. And the word, the big word across it is optimism. And underneath those word, the word optimism, it says every obstacle is a stepping stone to your success. Wow. A stepping stone to your success. There's another one. This one has a picture of a runner on a road, and the road just kind of goes off into eternity. You can't see the end of it. And the word, the big word is quality. It's quality. And underneath it, it says the race for quality has no finish line. No finish line. Then there's one that has a big picture of an eagle on it. And the word is leaders. That's kind of a hot topic in our day and time. And underneath it says, leaders are like eagles. They don't flock. You find them one at a time. Inspirational, huh? And then there's one that has this bridge and it's completely surrounded, top of the bridge, completely surrounded by clouds. And the word is goals, G-O-A-L-S. And it says, goals are the bridges that span our dreams. And then there's one that shows just this vast expanse of the serenity and grandeur of lush forests and mountains and, and vistas and these pristine waters. And it's just so beautiful. Uh, and, and the word is success. And underneath it, it says, it's easy to go down the mountain than up. It's easier to go down the mountain than up. But the view is best from the top. Success. Motivation inspiration. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those things or not, but you know, sometimes when I look at stuff like that, I wonder, is that real life? I mean, you know, I can look at those and some of those times when everything's piling up and say, man, is that is that really the way it is? I mean, so those, those things, do they just magically reach down and pick us up? I have to be honest with you, a lot of times I feel just the opposite of what some of those successory things are all about. In fact, sometimes I think what I'm about to show you is a little more real life. Maybe sometimes you feel a little like that and life seems to be saying, if at first you don't succeed, failure may be your style. I mean, that's where I live. That, that, that's where it's about. Or what about this one, mistakes? You feel like your, your, your life is just, just filled with mistakes. It, it could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. You ever feel like that? I mean, I'm all over that. You know, that's that's where that that's where we live right there. What about pessimism? Every dark cloud has a silver lining, but lightning kills hundreds of people each year trying to find it. Seminaries like that sometimes. I don't know. Failure. You ever feel like this guy when your best just isn't good enough? I mean, that's that's just the way it is sometimes. I like this one. Now, I'm all over this. Procrastination. Hard work often pays after time, off after time, but laziness always pays off now. Now, there, there's something you can build your life on right there, huh? Futility. You'll always miss 100% of the shots you don't take, and statistically speaking, 99% of the shots you do. It's just, it may not be where you are. It's where I live, though, okay? Mediocrity takes a lot less time and most people won't notice the difference until it's too late. Huh? Yeah. Stupidity. This one hits home right here. Quitters never win and winners never quit, but those who never win and never quit are idiots. Huh? You ever have a game like that? Huh? Defeat. For every winner, there are dozens of losers. Odds are you're one of them. And then, of course, there's agony. Not all pain is gain. I don't know where that came from. Huh? Huh? It's not all that way. But, you know, ministry is that way sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes it is about agony. In fact, that's the very context that the author of Hebrews depicts. It's the picture that he paints. When he comes to the table with a word of exhortation to a group of people who feel like all of those slides, they're like we do sometimes. Like life is not about successories and this kingdom work stuff is not all the time about successories, but instead we find ourselves feeling defeated. We 
find ourselves in futility. We find ourselves uh, losing. We find ourselves looking around, asking the question, can I get through this? Will I ever be able to get through this? You see, he writes these words, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, and here's the word, the race, it's the word from which we get our word, agony. Let us run with endurance this agonizing path that we've been called to, that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. The author of Hebrews beckons our recollection back to that great hall of faith that is given in chapter 11. And he sets them up as a cloud of witnesses which becomes the testimony and the motivation and the spurring on for us that says to us, we can do this thing. We can accomplish this thing. We can get through this and we can succeed despite what is happening around us. We can go on to greater discipleship. We can go on to greater ministry. We can go on to greater missions involvement. That's what he's calling us to here. You know the hall of faith in chapter 11. Verse 17, Abraham started it off and he was tested, offered up his own son. We can't even fathom that. Verse 20, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. And by faith in verse 21, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed his sons. And on and on and on down through this great hall of faith, name after name after name of people who become a testimony of faith, of success in ministry. But don't miss something about that hall of faith. It is not there as a museum of memories. But instead, it is a carousel for our consideration of an interlocking relationship that generation after generation after generation lived out before us as we look through the eyes of history to become a testimony of people who walked in faith always looking ahead. Have you ever noticed that about the Hall of Faith? In all of these people, there was something, there was one common denominator about them. They were always looking for something that came a little bit farther down the road, something that they might not experience in and of themselves. And the author of Hebrews reached back and grabs hold of their testimony and says, these people who lived for the not yet, these people who stood strong in the midst of all of this stuff around them are a testimony unto us. Not that they're in the stands cheering us on, but that their lives become an example for us of a people who have passed the gospel from generation to generation, always looking out in the future. I want to suggest to you today, that the only way that we will find success in ministry, the only way that we will be motivated in the midst of when everything is piling up or everything looks like defeat around us, is to live a life of faith that is always looking toward the next generation. Because this question is always looming over our heads when it comes to the agony that we live in sometimes. Will you stay in the fight. Will you stay in the race? I want you to hear the story of a young man who found himself in a position where he had to ask and answer that question. Derek Redmond of Great Britain a promising 400-meter runner whose career has been plagued with injuries. At the 1988 Seoul Olympics, Redmond was given a good chance of winning a medal. But just before his first qualifying race, he had to withdraw because of a pulled Achilles tendon. Other injuries forced him to miss major competitions, including the European Championships and Commonwealth Games. When the British 4x400 relay team defeated the heavily favored foursome from the United States, at the 1991 Tokyo World Championships, 
Derek Redman ran the second leg and became internationally known. However, in the following months leading to Barcelona, Derek Redman's physical condition was suspect. Six operations in three years, you tend to think about quitting, you know, a fair few times, but people keep on saying to me, you know, why don't you quit? And I always say for the joke, I don't want to go and get a real job. But here in Barcelona, Derek Redmond is in excellent physical shape and superb running form. On Saturday, August 1st, Derek Redmond in the blue pants leads in the first qualifying heat. It is his practice to win every race he runs, even though the first three finishers will qualify for the next round. Redmond defeats Roberto Hernandez of Cuba. The following day, in one of the four quarterfinals, Derek Redmond again wins, defeating Susumu Takano of Japan. Redmond's two performances are outstanding, and he's expected to easily get through his semifinal the next day. Nevertheless, most experts are predicting a clean sweep of all medals by the Americans. The papers always have their, uh, you know, prediction of who's going to win this and who's going to win that. And to be honest, it's, it's okay going on times, but it doesn't always happen that way. It's okay going there and saying, well, America's going to be one, two, three in this race. But no one knows what's going to happen. So it's nice to see that on paper, but none of the athletes really take it to heart because if that was the case, there'd be no point in competing. We'll just go on what was written. It is 7.35 p.m., Monday evening, August 3rd. Eight men line up for the first 400 meters semifinal. The first four finishers will qualify for the final, scheduled two days later. The favorite in the race, defending Olympic champion Steve Lewis of the United States. His main challengers, Roberto Hernandez of Cuba and Derek Redmond of Great Britain. Sitting in the stands, Jim Redmond, Derek's father, a former athlete and Derek's best friend. We are pretty, pretty close, um, even though Derek doesn't live with us. But uh, we see him every weekend. Uh, we speak to him every day of the week, sometimes twice, three times a day. So we share quite a lot of things together. We saw him on the morning of the event. Again, he was in marvelous shape, good spirits, his mind was right. He looked as if he was going to be the person to beat at the end of the day. Had a great warm-up, strides, everything went well, came out on the track, put my blocks down, no problems, told us to strip down, strip down. Then you have the little bit where you're standing in your lane and they come and shove a camera in your face so everyone can see who you are and block that out and everything. And he said, on your marks, get set. The race gets underway. Redmond is fourth from the left. Steve Lewis is in lane three. Because the lanes are staggered, Redmond will not see Lewis until they straighten out for the stretch run. Down the back stretch, Redmond starts to make up the stagger on the runners outside of him in lane six, seven, and eight. I couldn't believe that I was running that quick. Couldn't see Steve Lewis because he was on the inside of me. And then the next thing I heard was a funny pop. Derek Redmond has a torn hamstring in his right leg. After only 150 meters, his quest for an Olympic medal is over. The race goes on. Steve Lewis, third from the right, starts his drive. Derek Redmond is in severe pain. Well, I remember looking up across the back straight because by this time everyone had gone round the bend and we're halfway down the home straight uh, and then I watched them go over the line and obviously I knew it was over. Steve Lewis, United States first. Roberto Hernandez, Cuba second. Ibrahim Ishmael, Qatar third. Now for Derek... What do you do when all your dreams come crashing down around you? What do you do when your life and your ministry seems to be in such turmoil that everybody seems to be crossing the finish line ahead of you, attaining all the glory and all the honor that you long for? The author of Hebrews was writing to a group of people who were down on the track, whose life was in agony. And they had a choice to make, and that choice was whether or not to wade through that agony and live with it and finish the race, 
or to bow out and shirk their responsibilities as Christians, as saints in the kingdom of God, in all that God had for them. And the author of Hebrews steps in and he offers through four verbs in this passage of Scripture, four directives that help them and help us today to be able to answer the question, can we succeed? Will we stay in the fight? Will we stay in and finish the race? Directive number one, alleviate. Alleviate, he says in verse 1, seeing we've got this big cloud of witnesses, these ones who bear a testimony that it can be done, these ones that look to the future, the not yet, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares or impedes us. The author of Hebrews says, alleviate yourself from anything that is going to keep you from finishing the race. When you come to the place in your life where you feel like giving up, when you come to the place in seminary, when you come to the place in your ministry where you look around you and the pain is so agonizing, he says it may be time for some alleviation. So look around to see what baggage you can unload that may be keeping you from finishing the race. He offers two possibilities of things that weight us down. First of all, he says every weight that can ensnare us. You understand that there are some things in life and ministry that may not necessarily be wrong, but they still hold us back? The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. Let me tell you something. Some of the toughest calls that you'll have to make in ministry are not between what is right and what's wrong. But the toughest calls that you'll have to make will be between what is better and what's best. You see, most of us have settled the issue of the right and the wrong. And in a general sense, not to say that we don't sin, because we do, but in a general sense, some of those tough calls have already been made. We settled them a long time ago. But what keeps a lot of ministers from finishing the race is not choices between right and wrong, but choices between better and best. And I can't stand but stand up here and begin to name all of the possibilities of things that could be weights in your life. I only look back at the book of Hebrews and I think about some of the ones that that he's talked to them about. In chapter 2, he spoke to them about inactivity, just not being involved in ministry, just sitting on the sideline, not doing anything. And inactivity can be a weight. He talked about rebellion in chapter 3 and chapter 6 of just an out-and-out defiance of what God wants. And that creeps in sometimes into our lives worldliness sometimes and getting so attached to the world. And I don't necessarily mean the sins of the world, but just just the world in general, that those things become so much a part of our lives. They may be uh, pastimes. They may be uh, uh, hobbies. They might be a relationship. I don't know. All of those things that could be good in and of themselves and maybe have a right place in our lives sometimes can become weights that hold us back. And they cause us to look at this agony that we're in sometimes and say, I want to throw up my hand. The author of Hebrews said not only weights, but he said the sin which so easily ensnares us. And that's where he moves it into the right and wrong category. That which is blatantly and openly sin. And of course, anything fits into that category, but there's something that intrigues me about this text, and that is in the language of the New Testament, the definite article is there. The author of Hebrews says the sin which so easily ensnares us. And it causes me to wonder if he might be referring to that primary sin that he's been speaking about all the way through this book. The simple, excuse me, sin of faithlessness. Of a refusal to say, God, I'm going to engage in the sanctification process that you have set me in. I'm going to let you mold me into your image so that I become more like Christ. Lord, I'm going to increase in my passion for reaching lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to let you do with my life and world missions what you desire for me to do and what this whole kingdom thing is about. The author of Hebrews said that that can hold us back, that display and that attitude of faithlessness. Alleviate, the author says. Directive number two, tolerate. It's found there in the bottom part of verse 1 when he says, let us run with endurance this agonizing event that has been set before us. 
in the language of the New Testament, the emphasis in this particular phrase right here is not so much on the verb, but it is on this qualifying clause with endurance. It comes at the beginning of the sentence. In other words, the author says, with endurance, let us run and complete this agonizing event that we've been called to. The point here is not alleviation. The point is toleration. Our willingness to tolerate under the agony that we're in. Somewhere along the road, somebody fed a lot of Christians a lie when they told them that once you become a Christian, all of this is supposed to go good. Somebody told us in seminary a lie somewhere, and that is that once you get out of here and go to your church, then everything is going to be blowing and going and growing, and everything's going to be hunky-dory, and there aren't going to be any struggles or any problems. Let me tell you something, my friend. The Word of God characterizes the Christian experience, not just ministry, as a ministry of agonizing. We are not of this world. It should not shock us when the government doesn't give us our rights. It should not shock us when the world comes against us and, and impedes the progress of the Gospel. It should not shock us when we find ourselves coming up against peril and distress, the Scripture tells us that's the way Christians are in this world. That's what the mix creates. Jesus told us that. Right after those great Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, He said you need to rejoice when you're persecuted for Christ's sake, for My name's sake. And it's like a lot of believers live today in a state of surprise and shock and outlashing when the world doesn't treat us like we think we're supposed to be treated. You see, our standard doesn't go back to the Constitution of the United States. It goes back to the Bible. And the Bible says we are to live a life of toleration, not toleration of sin, but toleration of agony in ministry and service of Him. Alleviation, toleration, a third directive is to fixate. The apostle, the apostle or the writer of Hebrews says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says fixate on one particular person, and that's Jesus. You look to Him and you lock in on this particular time. Now listen, I know that sounds mundane. I know it sounds simplistic. Maybe you get frustrated sometimes when you are in agony. You are in frustration. You need a real life successory. You need somebody to pick you up. And somebody comes along and says, Hey, brother, just look to Jesus. We've all heard that and we've all said that. I want you to understand that's not what the author of Hebrews does right here. He says you look with intentionality. You look for something specific. And he tells us what it is. He says, you look to Jesus, you fixate on Him, and here's why. First of all, because He's the author and the finisher of the faith. He is the beginning and the end. He is the originator and the perfecter. Now, let me tell you why that's there. He's just gone through in chapter 11 a whole scenario when He says... Elijah ran his segment. Moses ran his segment. Enoch ran his segment. Rahab ran her segment. Samuel ran his segment. He put all these people in their segments and said they all looked down the road to passing the baton to the next generation. They were all waiting for the not yet, something they didn't even see in their lifetime. But he says, let me tell you about Jesus. I don't want you to fixate on Elijah. I don't want you to fixate on Moses. I don't want you to fixate on Enoch. I don't want you to fixate on Rahab. I want you to fixate on Jesus because He started the thing and He finished the thing. He's the only one that runs every leg all through the race. Now that's one you can focus on. Because you see, you've only been called to run one leg. I've been called to run one leg. And that's what this passage of Scripture is about. Our one leg. Not the whole relay. Our leg. Finishing our leg. And let me tell you something. This passage is not about winning the race. It's about finishing the race. Now, Paul uses the analogy sometimes in Scripture, the race analogy, to refer to winning and make that point. But not here. He's not talking about winning. He's talking about you faithfully running your leg to the end. And he said the motivator for that is the one who started the thing and finished the thing, has run every leg. And you know what that means? That means he ran it with Moses. That means he was there running it with Enoch. That means he was there running it with Elijah and Rahab and every leg. And guess what? He's running it with you. 
fixate on Jesus. The one who started it and the one who finished it. But he also said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, let me tell you what you're not supposed to be motivated here. You're not supposed to be motivated by the cross thing and the throne thing. You don't have to go to the cross and you don't get the big chair at the right hand of the throne of God. That's why He's the author and finisher. That's why He's the one that we're to fixate on. That's not the, the, the writer's point here. He's talking to us about how He accomplished these things. Look at it. He says He did it with the, for the joy that was set before Him. Jesus lived for the not yet. He was able to withstand in His ministry because He was always looking for what lie ahead, what came down the road, not the immediate point. And oh, how that would change some, change some of our semesters, some of our classes, some of our churches, some of our ministries, if we could only realize that this is not where it ends. This is not the last chapter. This is not what it's all about. But there is a not yet, and it is a joyful not yet who for the joy that was set before Him endured this cross, despising the shame, ignoring it, rejecting it, moving ahead through it. It's going to be there. But Jesus despised it. He set it aside. He didn't let it affect Him. There's an interesting contrast in the verb tenses there in between the verb, uh, the verb to endure. Jesus endured the cross and being set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In the language of the New Testament, the word endured ends, indicates an action that has an end, a once in a, a, a point in time. The word to sit down is in the perfect tense to mean something that happened at some time in the past but continues into the present. I don't think that's by accident. You know why? Because it says the endurance for Jesus was just for a season. But the sitting at the right hand of the throne of God is for eternity. And let me tell you something, brother, sister. Your endurance, your agony is only for a season. If He's your model, when you fixate on Him, there will come an end to that. Oh, but the joy and the glory and all of eternity is forever. Fixate on Him. He becomes the motivator. Alleviate, tolerate, fixate. And finally, imitate in verse 3. For consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You see the word consider? It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And in the language of the New Testament, this is a word that doesn't just mean take a look at, but it means to take a look at and analyze or compare. You say compare to what? Well, what would the comparison be? The comparison between His life and your life. He says, you consider Jesus up against your life and you compare the two so that you can be encouraged to do the same thing He did. So you won't become discouraged. He ran the race all the way through. He's still running it with you. And when we fixate on Him, He becomes a model for us to imitate so that we can despise the shame so that we can look for the joy and live for the not yet, so we can survive in the midst of the agony. The question is before us, as it was before Derek Redmond. Will you stay in the fight? Will you finish the race? Hear the end of the story. the knowledge that he finished what he set out to do. You had people coming out with the stretchers, and it was that that made me get up and and run, because I ain't getting on that stretcher. I got too much pride to want to be stretched out of the stadium. I couldn't believe what I saw, because uh, I realized it was Derek, but I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it, because we'd seen it before in Seoul, and we didn't think it that history would repeat itself. I remember placing the camera on the floor, and uh, if you ask me why I did what I did, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't say exactly what made me do it. I couldn't remember how it was done. It was just a fatherly instinct, and up to this day, I don't know why I did it. The first thing my dad said is he put his arms around me, and he said, look, you don't have to do this. Um, and, I, and I tell him, I said, I do. And he said, well, if you're going to finish this race, we'll finish it together. When I told him that he didn't have to do it, he told me that he wasn't going to be carried off, he was going to finish. 
and he asked me to get him back into lane five. And that wasn't the place of a family argument, so I just complied with his wishes. ceremony takes place. Quincy Watts of the United States stands on the top step of the podium. Steve Lewis, United States, second. Samson Qatar, Kenya, third. I think definitely he would have had the bronze medal. The silver was available, and if the silver is available, then the gold was possible. Which one, I don't know. But he would have been a medalist. So the story leaves off as it began. The journey of Derek Redmond. A journey that celebrates all that is right in sport. One that gives true meaning as to why we play these games. For it has been written, the honor should not go alone to those who have not fallen. Rather, all honor to those who fall and rise again. People have said to me, you know, call it a day, call it a day, and I'm not saying I'm the world's best quarter miler, but I'm a quarter miler of some merit. And um, I can't give up not knowing what I can do um, until I've exhausted that, that sort of ability or, or the time to, to prove that, I'm not going to stop. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. for you between this story and our text under consideration. Number one, in the midst of your agony, claim the ability to hold on to the end. This text wouldn't be here and these directives wouldn't be there if God had not provided the grace for you to finish and finish strong. Number two, remember, that your father will finish the race with you. He started it, and he'll finish it. You see his dad come out of the stands? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Yours is already out of the stands. Jesus Christ. Arm in arm. And what you started together, you'll finish together. Number three, get back in the lane you started in. The first thing he said to his dad when he came out on the track is, get me back in lane five. Did you see him point over there? You know why? Because Derek Redmond knew that if a runner doesn't cross the finish line in the same lane he started in, he's disqualified. And he didn't want to be disqualified. Some of us this morning are in a different lane than we started in. We look back on our Christian experience, the way we started our walk with the Lord, or maybe those early years, and we've drifted a lane or two. And it's time for some of us to say, in the midst of the agonies there, Lord, help me back over into lane five. Help me back over there to see what it was like and where I was before. And finally, when you fall, rise again. When you fall, and you're going to fall in this agonizing race, you're going to fall. If it hadn't happened yet, it will. But when you fall, rise again. Because you see, all honor shouldn't go to those who've never fallen, but to those who fall and rise again. One thing that wasn't on the clip, the interviewer put a microphone in Jim Redmond's face after that whole scenario and said, what did you say to the security guard when he stopped you on the track and he asked you your credentials? Jim Redmond's response was, listen, when your boy's in trouble, you don't need any credentials. Well, let me tell you something, brother, sister, Colleague, student, 
Your dad's got all the credentials. He's got all the credentials and he's already on the track. And when his boy's in trouble, when his girl's in trouble, he's going to be there. He's going to be there for you. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for hope and certainty and grace when things look bleak in the midst of agony. We thank you for a faith that anchors us to the finish line and ensures that we cross it. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.